First of all, let me welcome you to this panel discussion. Um, the, the dialogue this morning started pointing in the direction of many of the topics we'll be covering um, um, in this window, which will focus on technology and the, and the user experience, what's going to be the regional outlook. So what we're going to do is really deep dive into many of the questions that surfaced um, earlier today and try to put them into the perspective of our region, uh, specifically in, in the Gulf. And we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished panelist with us representing uh, pretty much the four corner of, uh, of the industry we serve. Um, in no particular order, and starting on my left, uh, Mark, uh, Avgis Mark is the Director of Strategy, of Corporate Strategy and Intelligence um, at QTEL International. So he'll bring the telecom service provider perspective. Um, uh, next would be Engineer uh, Nashi Al Kharousi, who's a full time member of the Telecom Regulatory Authority in Oman. We've heard this morning um, uh, from, you've heard this morning from myself and others regarding the expectations from policymakers and regulators. So I'm afraid, Engineer Nashia, that will put you under the spot. Um, you'll have to answer on behalf of all the policymakers. Um, next um, is Jeremy Foster. Jeremy is the marketing director for Ericsson Communication in the Middle East. So we'll have the sort of the industry or the technology angle to our discussion. And last but not least, uh, Hamad Al-Manna. Hamad is the CEO of uh, Knowledge Ventures in Qatar and a board member. And uh, among other things, uh, Hamad and his team have been investing in a number of ICT-related ventures, whether in connectivity and, and uh, other premises. So I think this is a very, very comprehensive panel. Uh, in our discussion today, we'll be having a dialogue among the panelists. There won't be any PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the dialogue will be under uh, Shatam House rule, i.e., what is said in this room, will say in the room. It will not be attributed to anyone. Um, in particular, I can appreciate that this will be quite um, challenging for the operator and the regulator, so um, I cannot give you my firm commitment, but my understanding is there won't be any headline tomorrow morning saying X has said Y and uh, someone will be in trouble. Um, so what I suggest we do, and this is meant to be interactive, so I would like to get as many questions as possible from the, um, uh, from the audience. Um, and to start to warm up the discussion, what I've uh, suggested or invited uh, the, the different panelists to prepare some thoughts, which uh, they will provide us with, um, around four angles. One, how and what technology will be best realistically rolled out in our part of the world to realize the, the, broad, the broadband premise. We've heard this morning uh, a number of ideas. We went through a number of examples from around the world. Um, I think it's time to put it in, in the context of, um, um, of our um, economies and our terrain. And they can be quite different, whether you're operating in a country like Bahrain or in Doha or in Kuwait, um, uh, or on the other extreme, if you're in Saudi Arabia or in the, you're in the UAE or in Oman. Um, so clearly the dynamics are going to be different. And at the same time, what are going to be the complementary enablers so that to make the rollout of any technology viable? The second question is around the broadband access devices. What is going to be their likely evolution in our part of the world? What is going to be this ubiquitous, this AHA um, access device that will pretty much bring uh, broadband to a universal level? Uh, and again, we may have a debate that there won't be a single one or there won't be a leading one, but let's have that debate. And, and you, we would like to know the different views, both from the industry perspective or from the service provider perspective. Thirdly is, what are going to be the product and service innovation that will make this broadband promise uh, come to life sooner rather than later? Uh, because as discussed yesterday, we're talking about three things at the same time. We're talking about the superhighway, the mean to travel on the highway, and ultimately the, the destination. So, I would like to invite the panelists to talk a bit about the different destinations, what will make broadband truly a, a, an important experience. As Chef puts it this morning, it will become pretty much like everything else we have, like power. Uh, but we, put, we use power to do something. What is going to be that something? Um, and last but not least, and most importantly, what is going to be the government role in this? Should the government be in a role of funding? Should the government be in a role of deploying the infrastructure? Or should the government be in, in a role of um, operating? So taking the three extremes, funding, deploying, operating, or just limit the government role and the regulator role 
um, within a, a sort of a policy definition and enablement, but do not uh, move um, the government in any sort of role in the kitchen, if I may refer to it uh, this way. And if not, who should take the lead? So if the government is not going to play a prominent role, and we all agree that there has to be a national broadband network, this 21st century digital network, then I would like to hear from my um, panelists, colleagues, who will be taking the driving seat in this process. So on this note, I'm going to pause. And uh, Mark, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, broad range of questions. <laughs> You asked me to limit responses to, I think, about three minutes to get us started. Um, let me just pick out a few points, um, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that. I think what you said around the broadband technology is an important one. I think we, we spend a lot about um, um, hearing this morning about fiber investments and things like that. I think if you look at a company like, like Qtel, uh, Qtel International, I, one thing just to emphasize is that about 75% of our revenue actually comes outside of Qatar. And, and a key element we're focusing on a corporate strategy is actually providing broadband um, in, in a number of emerging markets, both in the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa region, but also uh, in, in Asia. Um, if we look at that particular dimension, I mean, what, we, what we're seeing is that we need to take a very sensible look about where we're putting our investments. And there are a number of technologies we can use. Obviously, we heard about fiber. In many cases, actually, um, um, upgrading or using legacy copper infrastructure, upgrading that to ADSL to VDSL actually allows for a great opportunity to provide broadband services more quickly and, and, and with a more manageable investment as well. Um, and what we see in many emerging markets um, um, is that actually that infrastructure might not even exist, so we need to find ways of, of um, either indeed putting in completely new infrastructure. And, and what we're actually doing in many emerging markets is, is using WiMAX technology. Uh, we're one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, emerging market investor in, in, uh, in WiMAX in countries such as Jordan, uh, Philippines, and Pakistan, um, which is not a great way of, of offering it. Now, a fourth element is providing um, a 3G or HSDPA kind of mobile technology as an alternative to fixed line. Now, those things are helpful, but I think we all recognize in the end, as data starts to grow, we need to have kind of real broadband networks um, um, that deliver that on an ongoing basis. Now. The trick we need to recognize, though, it's not just about providing infrastructure, and that comes to back to your question about well, what other kind of activities are required there. If we look at a, a country such as Qatar, and it's actually quite specific to some other markets in the region as well, we just need to understand where is all of this traffic, all of this broadband consumption going to. Now, Qatar is quite, and, and many Gulf states are quite specific in that region. If you look at markets such as Japan, 90% of traffic is actually domestic in the sense it's, it's using domestic content, and just 10% is international. Um, many European markets, about 50% national, about 50% international. If we look at a market such as Qatar, it's actually completely the reverse. 90% is international, just 10% is, is national or regional. That has a big impact on, on how countries such as Qatar and other countries in the Gulf look at developing their broadband strategy. A key bottleneck there is not only what you provide for the last mile, but what you provide in a backhaul. And that's one area where um, we see kind of a real need for um, um, investment as well. And Qto as a group is investing heavily. I know um, Qatar um, in various forms, Qatar Foundation, um, um, Knowledge Ventures is, is investing in, in the backhaul activities as well. Um, that's a key enabler I think we need to think about as well. On the service innovation side, we also need to recognize again, it's not just, it's not build and they'll come. It's not if you put in a fiber, uh, 100 megabits uh, or 1 gigabits, um, um, that, that, that all of a sudden all of these servers will be there. I think we just need to recognize also that stimulation on the demand, demand side is very important. If we look at many of the Gulf Northern African uh, uh, regions, some of the basic things like e-commerce are actually a bit behind what we see elsewhere in the world. Simply providing high-speed internet is not going to change that, so there are other things that we need to do. Um, kind of driving that to what, what is the role of the government in this? I think this is the kind of one point. I think the government can really help and regulators can really help in also addressing those particular points. Um, how do you stimulate the demand? Um, how do you help with things like kind of backhaul? Um, um, but also how do you look at other things? I mean, what, what's interesting is um, great, there are ways of, of looking at, at helping um, support and stimulate fiber investments. The other thing we need to think about as well, well what is actually in that last mile? And, and, and what I found very interesting to hear about uh, our, our colleague from, from Hong Kong is about kind of how they help put quality standards for buildings in, in building um, wiring, which is quite important. I think we're seeing a couple of examples here in the region where 
um, by having not having that managed well, you end up having fiber to the building, but then actually having quite a big bottleneck in the building itself. If we look at the overall investment in, in broadband networks, I think we need to kind of address the thing of what is there something like market value? If you look at a, a company like Qtel, we're definitely investing heavily and we'll invest a lot more in driving uh, next generation investments. We're taking a leadership role there. As a regulator across uh, markets, I think you need to ask yourself the question, well, what, what is indeed the best way? Do we need to drive this? Is, is, there, is it not going to hap happen unless we drive this? Should we play a facilitating role? Kind of acknowledging that actually, if you look at markets on average, the covering the large 30% of your population actually triples the investment required. Knowing that thing, maybe it's about the subsidizing those kind of things, not necessarily finding ways to move into the areas that the market can manage itself. So subsidizing there might be an, another area to focus on. Um, and I think, um, um, kind of last, lastly, I think one of the key things that I think, and every regulator would probably acknowledge that, which is really important, you need to be clear, for any, incent, for any investment to take place, an investor needs to have at least some degree of certainty about um, um, what that investment will do, that they don't find themselves a year down the line seeing the complete regulatory regime change. So clarity about what your regulatory position is is, is quite important. Well, let me just leave that at that. Probably over gun the three minutes. But, oh, that's uh, perfect. <laughs> that's exactly what we want to cover. A lot of questions will surface from this. Thank you, Mark. Engineer Ignacio. I will uh, speak on my personal perspective. First of all, I think the government role is, first of all, is to facilitate and create the demand. What it means, it means that they should be service, government service to start with in order to create the demand in the market. Now, to focus on, in the, on infrastructure without focusing in creating demand, it will be just a wastage of uh, throwing uh, investment into the infrastructure, even if it is coming by subsidies or fully financed by government. So what it means, it means that there should be applications, there should be content where it will uh, absorb the uh, capacity what uh, we are looking at. Second, uh, on the infrastructure, the uh, solutions, it will depend on each country differently. For example, I'm giving an example on Oman. Oman, if you just look at the core business, the core, which means the backbone, that's not a big problem because both the operators, two operators, the existing one has invested heavily on the core and the new operator is going to, has been, uh, has committed to invest heavily, where we are going to have two parallel co-network uh, uh, co uh, operating at the same time. And the reason, because at home we had uh, faced GUNO, you know, the, the, and uh, we suffered from this, that one of, the, that network which was existing, it went off the air, cut off, very badly, it affected all other operators, so we needed to have another one parallel to that, how they will work together that we will see in the next phase once this is uh, implemented. Second, the problem at home is the access networks. The access networks, yes, we have seen, mobile has taken over from fixed. The ADSL, for example, it's not uptaking at all. It seems that bro uh, mobile broadband is taking over, but it, it is limited. If you look on a long term, it's limited. So then we have in the major city or the capital, we have other projects which are going on on the infrastructure where uh, like we have a project uh, on uh, wastewater treatment, which is, uh, which is uh, for the whole uh, city of Muscat, will be connected. Now, this is an opportunity for the, this company to lay the fiber because the incremental cost for the total project is minimal. So it cannot be, it's an opportunity that cannot be repeated. 
again, how this network and who will operate it and how it will be uh, regulated, this is we did not address. We are looking into it. Uh, but this is, again, it's a long term. It's, it will not be ready except by 2019. Now we have a problem of ADSL. Should we unbundle it or not? Because the, in the capital area, the uh, new network will be ready by that time. We have auctioned the uh, spectrum for the broadband, and we are going to auction more in, in this year. So all this, all these, uh, what, can, what, what, can, what I can say are tools, but is the demand, creation of the demand is important. It is not just to be ready with a network when you do not have applications for it. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Nashio. Jeremy? Thank you, Karim. I um, um, would just like to pick up, if it's interesting how the thread of, uh, of our speakers uh, kind of gets connected, and I promise you it's not rehearsed. But uh, I believe that we should start thinking, you know, if we imagine ourselves five years into the future, what kind of applications will our consumers really enjoy? And, and I'd like to make a prediction about a killer application. And, uh, and it's based on, on three things. Context and um, uh, technology, and a particular tipping technology which has actually been around for 700 years, which we only just see coming out in our phones today, 700 years. If you can imagine what is a technology that has existed in the world for 700 years and why might that, might that make a difference. And then finally I'd like to talk a little bit about values and how the values of our consumers are shifting. So when I joined Ericsson about 13 and a half years ago, we always had this idea that one day in the future, 2010 sounded like such a long way away, we thought it would be a long time ago, back in those days, we'd be able to walk past a hamburger joint and your phone would go off, would you like a cheap hamburger? Of course this application never ever happened because in order for that notification to be useful you actually need three pieces of information. Yeah, I know where you are, but are you hungry and have you got any money? Because if you're starving and broke and someone sends you a picture of a nice big hamburger, you're not really going to be very happy, are you? The information hasn't been delivered in the context of what you're interested in. And I think the first measure that we should think of of these um, personalised services, these new revenue streams, um, all the new kind of stuff which is going to come, we need to make sure it's within the context of the day of the person, otherwise they're not going to use it. And you can test this against things like I make a telephone call to my friends or I rush home and I access the internet. I think that all of these things meet a context of what the person wants. But what tipping technology will help deliver that context to someone now wherever they are? Well, of course we need broadband, we need it to be mobile, it needs to be ubiquitous. This term ubiquitous comes from the Latin word ubique, which means everywhere. So whichever technology we choose, no matter where our consumers go, it should work just the same. Secondly, most of our devices actually have cameras on them and very nice screens now, and I don't think that's ever going to go away. Positioning technology is starting to become available on most phones. And in fact, uh, even only this year, you will see that positioning inside buildings, not reliant on satellite, will start to um, become significant and uh, uh, watch out Barcelona for something that will get announced, not from Ericsson, I have to say, uh, but it will make a big difference. But the tipping point that I'd like to bring up is actually the compass. For me, the compass will be the one piece of technology which suddenly binds all of the other ones together because it's not only that I know where you are, it's I know which direction you're looking at. What are you looking at? What's in front of you? If you imagine being able to filter out 355 degrees of information that is not relevant. Suddenly it starts to become very interesting what you can do with your devices. And we already see this in places like Japan and any of you who are lucky enough to have an iPhone 3GS, any iPhone 3GS owners? We have some lucky people here. You have a compass in your phone already today. So what can you do with this to help create the context? Well, in places like Japan, what they see is, is as you hold your device up and you look around, they start to overlay virtual information into the viewing screen of what you can see around you. 
Now, for example, if I'm hungry, I might have a short code to press feed me. And now, as I start looking through the viewfinder, all of the McDonald's stores and Burger King stores and restaurants and Starbucks, they start to look like little icons that I can see in the distance because I know it knows where I am, it knows the direction I'm looking at, and I've created the context by saying I'm hungry, or maybe I'm shopping, or I'm looking for presents, whatever it might be. But the point is, is that I've created that context. Now the interesting thing is, from an end user point of view, we kind of think as we're looking at this new world, and, and this is, term is called augmented reality, using the virtual world to enhance the real world. If you think about it, when I look through, I see these blinking icons of Burger King, and for me it feels like they're just kind of blinking there. But what's technically happening is that I created the context and I forced them to blink at me because I'm hungry. Send me this information. Broadcast your data to me. I'm the one that created it. And what that means is, is that from an operator point of view or whomever provides that service, they can then go to the Burger Kings or the McDonald's and say, hey, guess what? 85% of the people who are hungry found you when they were standing over here. One of the big things that Google earns a lot of its money from is by providing the context and the insights to the end users who surface stuff on the internet. This is what they do. Unfortunately, though, technology is not really enough, and I think values is the last point I'd like to just cover. And um, Karam already mentioned uh, the idea of digital natives, and for those of you who weren't here yesterday, in, in, inside Ericsson we think of anyone born after 1980 as being a digital native. For them it's very natural that you find things on the internet, every phone has a camera, and uh, for us old people, we think of ourselves as digital immigrants. We kind of came to this world. Actually, the world kind of came to us. And in fact, it's, it's our fault in this room. We're the ones that did it. So we're the lucky ones. Because can you imagine how confusing it must be outside the door of all of those people who see their children starting to embrace these technologies? And you know, the interesting thing about values is there's been a dramatic shift. And I'd like to summarize this up by convenience versus privacy. And uh, there was a book written many years ago called 1984. All of you oldies will have heard of it, George Orwell. All you youngies would never have heard of such a book. Anyway, they had this thought police that would read your mind. And everyone thought, man, that would be terrible, terrible future. Because so we don't need that. We already have that today. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have MySpace. People run home and go and update their, uh, their information. They broadcast the world. It adds value to them. And I think that you know, one of the interesting things for us to consider when um, uh, we're thinking about policy and plans is that the values of our of this digital natives are shifting so dramatically. It already happened uh, a little while ago when you saw the difference between um, caller line ID versus non-caller line ID. You know, when I ring you and you used to pick up the phone and, and I'd say, uh, hello? Hello, who's this? It's William. Hi, William. How are you doing? I'm good. Now, maybe I'm ringing William and he says, Jeremy, I'll call you in five. And he hangs up on me. I'm not offended. I'm happy to give away my privacy for the convenience that we had an interaction. And I think that a question I'd like to throw into the middle of the room for a bit of arm wrestling is the idea that if these digital natives born around 1980, if they're now in their 30s and they're starting to become a dominating factor in our worlds, if we look in Saudi Arabia, we look in Qatar, the Middle East, there is a huge number of young people who have dramatically different values from all of us. How do we make sure we embrace enough of what is interesting and useful for them as we create our policies so that when we choose our technologies and so on, we choose in the right context related to them? So context, I think, is key. Delivering context by combining these technologies like the compass and broadband and imaging and so on, augmented reality. And then finally, values, identifying and, and embracing those values and recognizing that maybe what we've brought into this room today, maybe some of those things we need to leave out the door and embrace some new ideas. Um. Excellent. We'll go back to the discussion of innovation. Hamad? Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. I was born in 77, so I don't know what you think of me, which, where do I belong to? Uh, so, uh, we have seen how the telecom companies have uh, really t uh, transferred from, from being a traditional fixed operator uh, prior to the mobile. And uh, at that time, 
there wasn't much of a, of a business case for this company. They were really surviving on in the international calls. Then uh, the mobile with the voice, and voice uh, used to worth really money, and there was the data, which is the only the SMS data, and we have to differentiate between the data of the, of the mobile regular network and the internet data, or internet-enabled data, which we see today. Uh, so uh, there was a big business case for mobile operators. That's when they really went into privatization and went into the, these big IPOs and these big licensing fees. Now, I don't think uh, 10 years from today that we're going to see huge uh, value for any uh, license uh, of a mobile operator internationally. Uh, the reason is uh, even when we <clears throat> decided to invest in a submarine cable, uh, uh, we can see that the money is not necessarily is coming only from the operators. It's the content providers who are really bringing the money. Uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, or we can call Microsoft Net and Google and Yahoo, and Facebook are the most watched uh, 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 sites uh, in the MENA region, or probably internationally, I don't know where they rank. But uh, if we look uh, all over the globe, you see that Google and Yahoo and Microsoft now, they're competing to come to each region where they really localize their traffic. So the, and once they localize the traffic, we come to the model which uh, Dr. Hassa mentioned today about uh, the YouTube, uh, the, the, sorry, the BlackBerry where they would like to get some of the piece of the cake of the, of the money. We see today Google being engaged with HTC, and exactly nobody knows exactly what's their intention behind it or what's the business model that they're going to drive. But it's the big uh, company which really embraced the Internet around uh, uh, a business case is the company who's going to survive in the future. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that there would be a strong business case for operators, and that's why they are reluctant to do it. Uh, however, if we, look, if we look at it from a, a government perspective, in which prior to the 1990s, they, they, they were really uh, uh, welcoming, subsidizing the telecom. And uh, they were, it was basically part of the basic infrastructure. So whenever you build a house, the, you, you'll be guaranteed to have your, your, your telephone connected as well as the electricity and water. I think the government forget their role about it. And they have to go back to it. The, to, the reason is because government care about the well-being of the people and the national competitiveness, which is shaped by the internet-enabled data uh, in the next uh, few years. When we talk about the broadband specific, broadband, uh, uh, we have the economical uh, values and the social values uh, or, the pro uh, or the targets of the broadband. Here in the Gulf, uh, unfortunately, I think government have to step up not on, only from uh, the telecom or ICT domain. It's a domain that touch the overall uh, government uh, competitiveness. Uh, from an economical point of view about the objectives of the uh, broadband, the infrastructure really doesn't support the full cycle of the ecosystem of the e-service. So for any economical uh, uh, exercise, we'll have to have the full infrastructure being embraced. And again, this is why you see Google signing something with the, tel the Saudi postal uh, company just uh, last month, in which the postal <laughs> system in Riyadh is really supporting a full cycle of an e-ecosystem and e-services. And they are chasing uh, the Saudi uh, postal company for them to understand how they can, they can be the preferred supplier for e-commerce into, uh, into that region. Uh, if we take Qatar as an example, the postal services doesn't really, is not part of the uh, home delivery system. Also, when we talk about the ports or the custom authorities, they're not really supporting the, the, uh, the e-services uh, uh, game in here, and beside the railroads and others. When government really care about railroads, they have to care about what they're going to do uh, in, this, in this particular issue. If we look at Malaysia today, and 7% of their GDP is really uh, dominant by 7% uh, is, is related to the e-commerce activities in, in Singapore. We need to calculate how much of e-commerce co contributing to the GDP here in Doha. In China, it used to be 3%, and now it's moving to 5% in the last only uh, within two years. So, uh, for, and from the social perspective, if we take the media uh, as an example, we see how uh, two sites like Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, uh, they have really attacked the, new, the, the traditional newspaper big time. 
where people really now go into the uh, immediate uh, rich content on the internet instead of going to the local newspapers. And uh, this is only affecting all across the border. So the question for me is, uh, does government have to step up? Yes. They have to be engaged now to look at it, not only from a telco perspective, they have to look at it from their national perspective. And I don't think that role should be only the role of the ICT regulators or enablers. It has to be really coming from the heads of the states to decide. When we see Obama in 2009 and uh, he's really crushed on the uh, uh, stimulus plan to decide what he's gonna spend on and he's spent around 700 uh, billion US. You see that they really understand the value and how this gonna be part of their competitiveness advantage on the next uh, few years. Excellent, thank you, Hamad.